Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, this is to discuss uh, what happened in uh, Paris and uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of the Parties number 21. And um, I think it was an important moment in, uh, in history. And we thought it would be a good idea to get everybody well, everybody who wants to come and those who are watching us on the streaming to get together to discuss it and reflect on it and think about how it happened, why it happened, what its meaning is, what happens next. And um, there are five of us on the platform. We were all there in uh, playing, different, uh, playing different roles. Um, it was my tenth. Pete, I don't know which number? Uh, I think it's about 11 or 12, I think. Yeah. Uh, we met one person who had been to 22 because I, I think there was six, number 6A six and B or something. So <laughs> but it's been going on a long time and this one was clearly the most important of the outcomes. So we'll discuss that. I'm going to give, I'm, I'm chairing it, I'll give a few moments of uh, uh, my own thoughts and then we will go through the through the panel. Uh, we'll each take, actually a few moments is an exaggeration, we'll each take about 10 minutes and uh, try to get through to leave plenty of time for questions and discussions. Let me um, begin then, and I'll introduce the panel at each time, at, at the point we, um, we're about to hear from them. So let me do it a little bit uh, historically, um, in other words, what happened before Paris, and then say something about the understanding, the foundations in understanding for Paris that were somewhat different to the foundations of understanding <coughs> that had occurred prior to, say, Copenhagen and COP15. Um, I'll say something very quickly about the two weeks, and then something very quickly about the agreement. On the two weeks itself and the agreement, I won't say so much because that's going to be discussed across, across the table. Well, we decided uh, essentially in Durban as a world um, to try to go for something um, in three or four years' time, in, in essentially in, uh, in Paris this, this year. Um, that was an important moment because it was a moment when we started to see that the different countries were becoming ready to get together as a more uh, homogeneous, not a homogeneous group, but a more homogeneous uh, group than they had been um, before that. Uh, and that was a recognition, really, that uh, now we're in a world where two-thirds of the emissions are for the em from the emerging market and developing countries, whereas back in the foundation of the UNFCCC, in 92, it was something like the other way around. So you can, simply can't do it anymore unless all the countries were involved. And there was a growing recognition of the truth of that, particularly growing recognition in China that uh, they were already changing and they were going to continue changing and that they wanted to move to a leadership role and not simply as a, a group, as one of a group of developing countries. So, that realisation began in, I think, to be marked in Durban, and that was, um, that was very important. Uh, the preparation um, was good, particularly um, from Peru and from the French. Um, the uh, meeting in Peru, COP20, a year ago, really did start to get down to business as to what this was going to look like. It invited countries to put in their intended nationally determined contributions, INDC, but a highly political language, intended, no, not committed, intended, nationally determined, nobody's going to tell us what to do, and it's a contribution, that's we are participating, uh, we choose to, we're not forced to. Now that invitation to submit the INDCs resulted in 180 or so submissions. Quite remarkable. And it was an invitation. And for those who say things happen only with sanctions, there are many features around all this to show that's simply not true. So that was a very important 
story and we should salute the Peruvians for their very uh, strong role they played under Admiral Fulcabia, who was a, a very uh, good chair of Peru and played in uh, of the Lima Cotton. So that was uh, then many other things, of course, that happened, but it meant that the preparation and atmospherics and participation ahead of Paris was much better than in previous years. And the joint um, announcement in November of 2014, a year or so ago, uh, in Beijing from um, Barack Obama and, and Xi Jinping, was also very <coughs> important in its significance of showing that these two biggest emitters, these two biggest economies in the world, were ready to move to something strong and were ready to um, state them what their intentions were going to be on emissions. Many other features of the, of the run-up, but uh, that's what uh, I wanted to underline. My own role was uh, Ami du Cher for uh, Laurent Fabius, who was the chair, and on the, uh, it was a small group of advisors to Fabius and to Laurence Tubiana, who played a tremendous leadership role along with Fabius. And um, I was also a member of the Executive Secretary, Christiana Figueres um, of UNFCCC. She had a small strategy group. So <coughs> that was my sort of informal, formal bit. And uh, for transparency, I have to say, I wore a French badge. I was French for these uh, <laughs> two weeks and very happy to be so. The most important thing is I wasn't British. Um, <laughs> not, not, not because I don't like being British, I love being British, but um, the wonderful Pete Betts, who's on this platform, was leading the British uh, delegation along with uh, Amber, <coughs> Amber Rudd. And right at the beginning, we ought to salute the role that Pete has played in all this uh, for a long time, particularly in these last two weeks, but for long, long before that, in the 11 or 12 years that he's been involved. Thank you, Pete, and you were recognised in the Lords uh, on Tuesday, and I'm sure in lots of other places too, because you should be. Um, the foundations in understanding. I think that there was a deeper understanding of the risks of climate change, which has been building over a long time. It's taken a very long time to get people to understand the immensity of the risks that we run. I still don't think it's fully there, but it's better now than it was before, so people have started to understand at least the stakes that we're playing for. This isn't a place to rehearse them, but we haven't seen three degrees for three million years uh, on this uh, planet. It, it, that kind of thing rewrites the relationships between humans and the planet. I won't go on about it, but there was a greater understanding of the risk that we face. But something in addition, and particularly important, I think, now, uh, or in the run-up to Paris, and it's different from Copenhagen, is that the transition to the low-carbon economy is a very attractive growth story, and it's the growth story of the future, and it's the only growth story on offer. It means cities where you can breathe, cities where you can move, cities where you can be uh, productive. Um, it means biodiversity that's got a chance of carrying on. It means soils that can get uh, regraded and be fertile as well as capture carbon. It means all sorts of things that are much better than the way we've been doing things before. And that recognition that this is not some kind of trade-off between growth on the one hand and climate responsibility on the other, the recognition that that's a fake way of putting it, has, I think, changed the debate. I'm not saying that that's fully recognised, but it is much more recognised than it was before. None of that should detract from the radicalness of the change that we have to make. <coughs> It's going to be very big changes, very big investments, doing things very differently from before. But those are investments with very high returns and investments that radically reduce the probability of um, the deep damage from climate change. And that changing recognition, I think, was an important part of the story. Certainly in China, where I've been working for nearly 30 years now, and in beginning in India too, I've been working there for more than 40 years, and those two very big, crucially important countries, China is very advanced in that recognition, and that changing understanding is <coughs> happening in India too, but of course that's something we should discuss because a lot of other things happening in India as well. So I, I think that that understanding, that change, is very important. Air pollution has been a big part of that story, uh, and the deep damage from air pollution, but 
it's, it's more than that. Um, that was very important. At the beginning of the two weeks, I'm going to sort of be much lighter now because others will <laughs> say more. But at the beginning of the two weeks, we had 150 presidents and prime ministers who came. They did not have to come. They did come because they wanted to show their commitment. They came and they sent a message essentially to their negotiators to get on with it, do something, produce something. And that was very different from Copenhagen where they turned up in the end to try to deal with a complete mess of negotiators who hadn't really done things and trying to desperately sort it out. The Copenhagen Accord, which they pulled out of the fire in the last hours, was actually, in, historically speaking, quite a valuable thing because it came, became the Cancun Agreement. But this was very deliberately a different, uh, a different structure. Um, Prince Charles actually went also and I thought spoke uh, very, very well. And we, the, there was the Pope in the background with that Arto C, and his influence, I think, was a very powerful part of the, of the story um, as well. So that was the beginning of the two weeks. Then the, the President's Prime Ministers went away, and they got down to the usual sort of arm wrestling and uh, square brackets, and you know, how many square brackets have we got left? Is it under 100 yet? And all this sort of thing. Um, but uh, that opening was, was very uh, <coughs> important. Right at the end, um, it was still risky right until the last moments, but you've probably all seen uh, Laurent Fabius um, gaveling it through. Uh, he switched from the Comité de Paris to the plenary. The plenary was the one that was going to uh, approve it. He had previously got uh, the Deputy Executive Secretary to read out the typos. Uh, I, we won't go into that, but the... Um, and he said, uh, I see a positive mood in the room. I see no objections. Whack. And that was real time. <laughs> well, I, I gave it more or less verbatim yeah. in, real, in real time. There was a little bit of uh, excuse to be using an Eng English, a British uh, analogy, but it was a bit like um, Nelson putting a telescope to the blind eye. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, it all it all worked, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we stood up and cheered. Um, now that was the last moments, but that all depends on the careful preparation, the toing and froing, which um, Fabius and his team, and Pete and his team, and the other teams there uh, did uh, did so well. The agreement itself, of course, it's uh, the, the plenty of people, and perhaps I should leave it to others to go into the detail, but the tightening to 1.5 <coughs> as a possibility, at least the intention of try aiming well below 2 was very important, the review period very important, and the recognition that the INDCs added up to 55 billion tonnes, <coughs> which is 10% higher than now, whereas for 2 degrees we need to be 20% lower than now in 2030. That recognition was very important, and it brought the ramping up and, and uh, the review. Um, other things about transparency, good on finance and, and forests and so on. I'll leave others to, uh, to do that. Long-term goal in terms of the balancing of sources and sinks, net zero emissions, um, second half of the century. All that was, uh, all that was uh, tremendous. So let me uh, stop there. We can talk about what next. Some of the others might talk about what next. But we do have to ramp up. Uh, and we have tightened, and that should be the story. How do we uh, deliver? Um, let me just compare with Bretton Woods. Looking back, Bretton Woods must have been a doddle in the mid-1940s. Pre-decolonization, very few uh, countries, one dominant country, you could get agreement very easily. To get 196 countries to agree on this, given the controversies, different kinds of interests, it was almost miraculous, so uh, um, I'm still a bit exhausted and a bit euphoric, as you can probably tell, um, but I think something really significant <coughs> happened. Now, uh, Pete, one of the heroes of uh, Paris and before, he is the Director of International Climate Change at DEC, and he is uh, the lead negotiator for UK and for Europe. Have I got that right, Pete? Yep. So please, Thank Pete Betts. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, well, um, I won't repeat everything you said, which I, I agree with pretty well all of it. So um, 
I'll, do, I'll talk a little, I, I assume I don't need to say very much about what was in the agreement, so I also was going to talk a little bit about why it was successful compared to Copenhagen, for example. Uh, you've asked me to talk a little bit about how the two weeks ran and what were the turning points, uh, and then a little bit, you've asked me to say something about implications for UK policy, which of course we're still assimilating. Um, in, in terms of the sort of top line, this, was a, this, this outcome was at, at the very top uh, of our expectations, uh, probably in some respects slightly above you know, our top <coughs> realistic uh, expectation. Of it. Um, in terms of how successful it will be, the time will tell. Clearly it doesn't put us on track for two degrees uh, as, as to how much impact it will have on the market and on sort of political decision making, I guess we'll that's something we're going to be assessing. I'd be inter very interested to hear what others say uh, uh, in the course of this discussion. Um, in terms of the main elements, do I think you know? Uh, Five-year review cycle, long-term goals, zero net emissions, uh, a pretty well, a really excellent set of transparency arrangements, much better than we thought we would get, um, uh, and a continuing obliga obligation to mobilise finance by developed countries. Uh, still, so we, we've unwound the so-called firewall between developed and developing countries to some degree, but it's still there and that will be a contentious issue in the future. And we got um, a, 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 an outcome that was acceptable to us in which the islands and others were happy with on loss and damage. I'm very happy to say more about the substance, but I guess you can read that form from, the, from the newspapers and from other reports. Why, why was it successful? Uh, well, I agree with what Nick said. Firstly, I think we learned the lessons of Copenhagen and we and the French set realistic expectations and those, those were tested amongst the key players in a much more honest and um, grown up way than had been done in, in, in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen, we, we went, the, the range of possible outcomes in Copenhagen was, the was, was that, whereas in Paris we, we had reduced it to this. We knew what we, what we were debating about, we knew what the we, we really did know what the priorities, the parameters were of the deal. Um, secondly, uh, really top level political uh, leadership from Hollande and Fabius, but also from, from the Americans. I mean, no, nobody put more into this, I have, to, I have to say, at the highest level than the Americans, Obama and Kerry. Kerry was there all week, uh, all the second week. Uh, they, they really invested huge capital into it. I think, you know. Other, other, other leaders played a role, like Xi and you know, Modi and um, Merkel, Cameron and so on, but you know, really the Americans did put more into it than others apart from the French. And the, and the, and the, and the fact that the Americans you know, got understandings on some of the issues with the Chinese, in particular in advance, I think was important. I think the, the French did a, a really excellent job, not just in terms of how they ran the negotiations, but diplomatically, the way that they brought people <coughs> into the tent. Uh, and you know, gave people recognition. For example, the, the announcement on mission innovation was a was a real signal uh, to Mr. Modi that you know the world had understood his concerns about technology, for example. But underlying all that, as you were saying, Nick, um, I think there there has been a shift compared to Copenhagen. I think the emerging economies are willing to act in a way that they were much more reluctant to do in in Copenhagen. And underlying that is shifting real world economics you know the, the cost of alternative technologies is much lower than it was it's still in many cases more a bit more expensive uh, than, than for example fossil fuels but when you factor in co-benefits it's often not that not more expensive and you know most of what china is doing is probably being done for non-climate reasons or principally for non-climate reasons uh, you know air quality health energy security and so on so that that has changed the underlying economics for key countries uh, um, uh, I think also we, we just know more. We just know more about how you do this stuff and we're learning more as we go along, which is a reason to think that the five-year review cycle uh, could work. In terms of the, you know, what about, what about how the two weeks ran? So we, we as the EU, we as the UK, I mean, we, our, we, our top priorities were clearly were, were very clear going in. So our number one priority was the five-year review cycle, including the first one. So we wanted to, China and India were essentially saying, we've done our 2030 target, that's, you know, we can come back and, and set targets for 2040 in, in 2023, 2024, but we've done the 2030. We wanted the five-year cycle, <coughs> including a review in, 20, uh, in 2018 and the, and the resubmission in 2020 or 2021. 
We wanted the rules, in particular transparency and accounting. Number two, and number three, we wanted a long-term goal. Number four, we wanted a legally binding outcome. We knew that we weren't going to get um, everything legally binding, and we were m managing expectations on, on, the, on getting the, the hybrid outcome that we got, and we wanted differentiation. Uh, unwound this, this binary distinction between developed and developing countries. Now, I, I would say that the big emerging economies essentially didn't want any of those things. Um, you know, so although I agree with Nick that you know huge shifts in India and China, they are still, in terms of what they're doing at home, they are still very wary of perceived foreign interference, for, foreign you know infringement on on their sovereignty. So. I mean, I think they were up for some elements of those those things, but they were, they wanted much less than we did, and you know, to be to be blunt, that was the that was the that was the negotiation challenge. So we had we had our strategy. I mean, to be honest, the the, the week the two weeks basically unfolded as we had foreseen. Uh, uh, we we wanted to build uh, a coalition with the most the vulnerable countries to press for, for ambition, and we wanted to draw the Americans into that coalition. In Durban, we, it had been us, it had been the EU plus the vulnerables. We wanted it to, the, to have the Americans in the tent, and we wanted to reach out to the kind of to the big, powerful swing states like South Africa and Brazil. And that's actually what happened. We had some fears. So the first of them was was simply a process fear that you know if you're trying to if you're trying to land a deal of this complexity with 195 countries all playing, you know. Or playing, they're playing at being negotiators, holding everything hostage to everything else. The big risk was that we simply wouldn't be able to land a deal, and you know you need to move forward in, with small small rooms and with compromised texts that come from the presidency, and those are very tested, very contested, and people are very wary of those sorts of things. So you need to build the conditions where those sorts of packages can be put on the table. The second risk we, we saw was that the vulnerable countries would focus wholly on 1.5 degrees and loss and damage and wouldn't put any of their negotiating energy into pushing for ambitious mitigation outcomes. And the third risk was that we wouldn't keep the Americans um, on, 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 on line with us because what, we, what we've seen in previous COPs is that, and I'm being very blunt now, we're not in Chatham House, are we? No. I'm afraid it's being streamed. Oh, it? right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what, what, what some of our partners do is they don't necessarily attack um, the, the, the thing itself. So they don't attack a five-year review cycle or rules. They say those rules are fine, but we need to put differentiation in them. So then the Americans get faced with a choice between asymmetric rules with one set of rules for developed countries and another set of rules for developing countries and weak rules for everyone. And then the Americans go for weak rules for everyone. That was that was the risk that we we faced. Um, so, how did the two weeks run? Well, um, I think we were we were pretty pleased with the first week. There was some pretty, pretty polarizing rhetoric from some quarters, but I don't think that really galvanized or, or caught, you know didn't really gain traction with the wider COP. And I think we we managed to emerge in the first week with a much better text, which put us on track for the second week. But we didn't check, move any of the substance. I think the, 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 this high ambition coalition which emerged uh, in the second week, which was led by Tony de Bruyne, Foreign Minister in Marshall Islands, who played a fantastic personal role. I think that was hugely influential. Um, it didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, we've, it, we've had the Cartagena Dialogue since 2010, which I think the UK has probably done more than anybody else to drive to build those bridges between developed and developing countries. So there's a deep web of relationships and trust. That, that Tony was able to build on to, 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 to launch that coalition. Um, I, I think that it, we signaled flexibility on key vulnerable country asks like 1.5 and on loss and damage. I think that helped you know, to cement the coalition. The US, frankly, did the deal on loss and damage with the, with the islands that was done, and including Obama himself met the islands, uh, island leaders uh, on the Tuesday of the first week. So. That, that, as that fell into place, it freed up the vulnerables to really fo focus on, on ambition. And you know, in the end, the US, the US played held, held, held firm. The US pressed very hard for ambition all the way into the end game, and that was one of the big reasons we got such an ambitious outcome. And I don't think, I don't think you know, I'm not saying that the, the, the emerging economies were opposed to it, but I think they, 
you know, they might have been more comfortable with a, little, less, a bit less ambition on some of those areas. But I think also they, you know, they got important prizes in the agreement for them. I think it was important to them to see that there was significant funding provided for developing countries, even if they, weren't, they didn't see themselves as the major recipients. They've kept elements of differentiation, which is very essential to them. So I think it is a deal that, you know, gives everybody something. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that I shouldn't talk for too much longer. In terms of implications for UK policy, I think directly, probably relatively few, insofar as you know, we have a pretty robust and ambitious set of targets already and a target framework which is ambi ambitious. I mean, I, I would, if anything, I would say that you know, we now have a system that which looks a bit like the UK's being you know, taken forward at global level, a five-year um, re review cycle with you know, targets updated and so on. So I think that's something we ought to uh, look to see how we can work on, and maybe it will assist the politics in in the UK and in others. That you know, it's not just the UK that's acting. Um, we have got um, a, um, a requirement to pursue efforts towards 1.5 degrees, a collective effort. That's a collective as a collective goal. Um, I think the Climate Change com uh, Committee are going to look at what that might mean. Uh, we've also got um, a commitment, a global commitment to move to net zero emissions in the second half of the century. So again, that's implied by the two degree commitment already, so it's not a new obligation in some respects, but clearly that's going to be thought about. But overall, I don't think it has, we're, we're, gonna, we're plowing through all the detail of the agreement now and, and looking at what, what it might mean, for example, for reporting, but I think, I think there's, there's nothing uh, major uh, in terms of UK policy. So I guess the, the, but the acid test is, is, what is what is going to be the impact on, on the world. So we'll hear for that, on, about that from others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. And once again, recognising the enormous contribution that you personally made. And it's recognised not just in this country, but much, much further beyond. Um, now, um, we're going to worlds of uh, finance and uh, other forms of economic activity activity. So Zoe Knight, Managing Director of the Climate Change Centre of Excellence at HSBC. And just to emphasise, all, all five of us were there uh, in Paris for most of the time. Um, Zoe. So thanks Nick and, and thanks for the invite today to speak about COP21. Yes, it was an absolute privilege to be there um, and I think it's incredibly hard to articulate exactly how hard all of the negotiators across all of the parties worked over the course of those two weeks to come together to form a deal. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about capital allocation and what the deal means for the finance community. Um, so firstly, of course, Paris was an in incredible milestone on the way to the transition to a low carbon economy. It reinforces the direction of travel um, it reinforces the signal that low carbon is the global economy that we are aiming for and that we will ultimately deliver. And it does provide more confidence for low carbon investment. Now, there are still some challenges towards that in terms of the economics of high carbon versus low carbon, which I'll come back to in, in a second. But one of the most important points that I think has come out of Paris in its entirety is that it's created a virtuous circle of endorsement in the sense that in previous COPs uh, and, and uh, as part of the previous process, there's been some sort of disagreement between government investors um, and the real economy in terms of we need policy to be able to, we need policy signals for investment, we need, and the government needs investor support for policy. So I think we've broken that circle of, 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 of kind of blame of who should act first and move towards an environment where investors are actively asking for policy, which they've now got. Um, governments can have comfort that the finance community stand behind the decisions that they've made um, in order to get the, the Paris Agreement onto paper. So I think that shouldn't be underestimated. And I think that the Lima Paris Action Agenda did a fantastic job of bringing together um, the commitments from corporates, uh, from investors, and from cities and regions, which will play a, a significant role going forward. <laughs> Um, the third point is transparency, uh, as we've already mentioned. The INDCs provide blueprints of future development. Now, there will certainly still be discussion around 
um, in, in some areas around science, around speed of delivery, around how we will transition, but people can no longer dispute the planning for a low carbon economy. And what that means is that the choices that we make today may be right or wrong, but nobody can look back in 30 years' time and say, well, we didn't think that we would be generating more of our power from renewables in 2030 than we were in, in, in 2010. Um, and so that is quite a powerful uh, tool of discussion and, again, shouldn't be underestimated in terms of the achievement of getting those INDCs covering over 95% of greenhouse gases on the table. The other point that Paris was particularly good at was expectations management. Now, um, touched on the point that the US and China have been working together on a bilateral basis for over 18 months or so, and for us um, at HSBC, f following those conversations were incredibly important to, to um, how, how we've been talking about the Paris Agreement. Um, Expectations are critical. There are a huge variety of different stakeholders in this process. So civil society, for instance, and environmental NGOs might be pushing harder for a one degree or one and a half degree temperature goal, whereas business and finance might have slightly different outcomes that they were looking for. And I think that Paris has really been successful in terms of diplomacy and um, work throughout the year to, uh, to enable that sort of success among different stakeholders to be achieved. Now, um, some people have said to me, well, why hasn't there been a different reaction in the markets? Why, why hasn't there been a different reaction to um, share price performance in terms of the deal? And again, it's worth remembering that the whole point of the, uh, of the discussion and the whole sort of uh, ethos of the, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is to try and enable a smooth transition. So th this smoothness, we, we don't want a disruption in, in financial markets, we want a smooth transition to a low carbon economy. And where um, investors have asked me what, what might be the biggest surprise out of Paris, that's the point that I've make, been making. We, we, we want a smooth transition. A surprise for us would have been if there had been more focus on carbon pricing, if there had been a, um, a, a more significant element written into the agreement, um, which of course was in the decision but not in the agreement itself. Um, and, and that's what investors were working for, to, uh, were looking for. But nevertheless, uh, we expect carbon pricing to be implemented and scaled up. And, and the that investors are starting to take that into account when they're, when they're thinking about their own planning. So the other question now is, does the deal go far enough to deliver the significant change that we're looking for in terms of capital allocation into low carbon? Well, it does to some degree, but there's still some work to do in the sense that in, in many places, the economics of high carbon are more favorable than the economics of low carbon. Some of the pure play renewables names have delivered value over the course of the year. For instance, um, looking at some of the wind, wind farm operators, share prices have doubled since the start of the year. That's versus a market that's down 8%. So clearly there are pockets of value where investors can find um, opportunity and, and we expect that to continue. Um, but nevertheless, there's still more to be done around carbon pricing, and I'm sure there'll be some more questions on that. Financial regulation in some jurisdictions might not be conducive to investing in riskier, high, uh, sorry, low carbon opportunity. And, and, and I think that the work of the Financial Stability Board, Governor Mark Carney, has played a crucial role in furthering the agenda on, on climate disclosure and climate accounting. What do investors need to, to um, scale up their, their, their thinking around low carbon? Well, it's exactly that. It's, it's, carbon, it's climate disclosure, climate risk disclosure, tools for accounting for greenhouse gases. Now, in some of the conversations that I have um, across the world, the, the, the degree of knowledge around climate is so varied that in one meeting I might be having a, a detailed discussion around whether or not an investor should think about scope one or scope three greenhouse gas accounting for the portfolio, and in others it's as broad as what does a two degree world look like. So there's still some work to do on educating the financial markets as a whole, but COP 
21 has, has certainly gone a significant way to, to help with that. Um, one of the, the things that I think investors are thinking about now is, is how quickly will the, the, the sort of policy framework that is, is in place today be implemented going forward? And what will the scale up of, of towards low carbon be between now and 2020, which of course we know is an, inter interest, an important issue. And again, the power of disruptive technology. So how quickly will renewables become more economic in various regions? How quickly will um, energy storage, for instance, for instance, become a more mainstream technology? Um, the other point of, of finance in particular, there was a huge momentum throughout the two weeks in Paris towards more financial pledges. The Green Climate Fund already had 10 billion of pledges allocated towards it in, uh, in uh, towards the end of 2014. Um, finance as a signalling mechanism is is crucially important. But in Paris, 11 countries made more commitments towards the least developed countries funds, which is specifically for adaptation. France pledged another $2 billion for renewables in Africa from 2016 to 2020. So there's all of these stepping stones of commitment that bring together cities, investors, uh, corporates to, to provide that virtual circle of endorsement. So really, to summarize from our perspective, we think that Paris provided um, powerful signaling towards the transition of a low, to a low carbon economy. From, a, from the, the economics in terms of high carbon versus low carbon still needs some help and we think policy decisions will, will help with that in the future. And the, the, the toolkit needed to really change behaviour includes more climate disclosure which is the work of the Financial Stability Board and um, the Bank of England, People's Bank of uh, China tie up. So we've got these signals in place. People will worry about the speed of transition, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that I think there has been a step change in the way that the financial community is viewing climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. And now we turn to Annabella, who's the Senior Advisor on Climate Change Policy at uh, Statcraft. And um, she has had a long career in, in different places, lots on uh, carbon pricing, International Energy Agency, Norwegian Ministry of Finance. So, uh, Anna, looking forward to hearing from you, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to this panel discussion, which I think is very timely, less than a week after Paris, which gave us this new climate agreement, which we already heard about, and which I briefly will touch upon as well. Let me start with saying just a very few words about Startcraft. Startcraft is uh, Europe's largest renewable uh, energy producer. We are mainly a hydropower producer, but we are also heavily engaged into wind and looking into solar. We have our bases in Norway. We are 100% government state owned. We have about 18,000 megawatts capacity installed all over the world. We are also in 24 or well, close to 24 other countries, or 24 countries in all together have about 4,000 employees. Uh, but being a renewable producer makes climate policy, of course, extremely important to us, and that is also why we follow the climate negotiations and climate policies in general, and why the COP is important to us. Now we'll try to provide some business or utilities perspectives on the outcome of the COP uh, and, and structure that around three points. One is, is the COP a turning point for renewable energy? Then what uh, about the implementation? Are there market barriers which need to be overcome? And then a couple of words about technology and how that can facilitate uh, or contribute the, uh, the path towards decarbonization. The outcome of Paris, and you have uh, already discussed that uh, very thoroughly, and we agree with that. It is, I think, an agreement as good as we could hope for, or maybe even a little better than we have hoped for. It is applicable to all. It increases the global ambition level, and it sets a long-term goal of net emissions uh, by the end of the century, which we think is very important. It has been well prepared with the INDCs, and thus we think that this agreement has created uh, an atmosphere of cooperation and trust. It's the trust that not only you and me, but the rest of the world will implement climate policies and will cut emissions. And that might 
reduce some of the uh, barriers, not necessarily market barriers, but other barriers which we have seen, the discussions about carbon leakage and about competitiveness when only a few countries are doing something. So this atmosphere of trust thing we, we believe is, is very good, and that's very good for renewable energy as well, because the agreement puts the word on a track towards low carbon economies, and low carbon economies are not possible without a huge increase in renewables. So the spirit is good and we are optimistic, but the truth is in the implementation, as already has been said as well. And that brings me to my second point. Uh, are there market barriers which need to be overcome? For us, the objective is that investments in renewables and competitive technology, technologies should be fully driven by market, by wholesale, and by carbon market signals. So carbon pricing, so you already mentioned that as well, is crucial. It puts a price on emissions. It increases the relative competitiveness of renewables, but even more important, I think it also incentivizes to cut down capacity, to take capacity out of the market, while subsidies don't necessarily do that. And some of the problems which we see, especially in European energy markets, is that a lot of new capacity is coming to the market through more renewables, which is good, which is also good for us, but capacity is not being taken out. So the general price level is falling and investment signals don't work anymore. So carbon pricing, we believe, is crucial. The ETS is a good instrument for that in, in Europe. We support that fully. We support the MSR. We could even wish that the ETS would become stronger, that caps could be lowered, it would be then, <laughs> to make it stronger. Uh, that remains to be seen whether that could be a possibility, but uh, we are afraid that the ETS currently is not giving sufficiently strong signals for the required growth in, in renewables, neither in Europe and outside of Europe. The establishment of carbon markets is very positive and it remains to be seen how effective and efficient they will be. A second thing, and I uh, yeah, uh, is the erosion of wholesale markets and distortion of market-based instruments. One example is, for example, is, is when small-scale, especially decentralized generation is subsidized, where the business case is partly rooted in the big difference between retail prices and wholesale prices, because retail prices also are composed of wholesale prices and levies and taxes, and often levies and taxes are even higher than the underlying wholesale price. So in order to avoid higher retail prices, people would invest into small-scale decentralized generation capacity. That makes the wholesale market smaller <coughs> and price formation less reliable and distorts investment signals. And that might be a barrier for more investments into renewables. So, so the maintenance of wholesale markets in this structure to facilitate investments into renewables, we believe is, is very important. Another barrier is this, what we call the cannibalization effect. The more intermittent renewables we do have in a system, the lower is the price can be close to zero, sometimes even below zero, when a lot of renewables is in, in the grid. And that makes the hours where you can earn money fewer. The more renewables there is there, the fewer hours you can earn money on. So, so you distort the market for the others. How that can be captured, I am not sure, but that is a barrier for, for investment or market-based investment decisions for, for more renewables as well. We have the internalization of external costs, for, of all external costs, because also renewables, I'm afraid to say so, have external costs. They need to be integrated, and those are often linked to the necessity of more infrastructure, be it grid or interconnectors, or transformers to, for rapid charging of batteries, uh, for um, giving back up uh, electricity to those who are self-sufficient more with their own small-scale generation. But an even and fair cost allocation of those costs is important also to not distort the market and to provide those investment signals. And then lastly, um, many renewable investments, especially when you do them large scale, and we have an experience in hydropower and also uh, large wind, scale, wind parks, 
uh, have, are very capital intensive, so they have a very high share of capex. So access to finance and possibly risk alleviation for, for the risks entailed to that is a market barrier as well, can be a market barrier. There's sometimes more regulatory risk because this is still a politically steered market. There is a technology risk because it's often less mature technologies, not always. And there's often a country risk, especially when you invest in emerging or developing countries. And then capturing the longevity of renewables, and that is a special case for hydropower, but also for many of the others, wind power or wind parks, into the business case is also a, a challenge. Maybe not so much in a very low interest rate environment, but in a higher interest rate environment, uh, the longevity is not really recognized when you compare projects with other projects. So we think it is important to find market-based solutions to those challenges and not fix various problems with various crews in the market which, which make the market as such weaker because of the investment signals need to be strong for renewables. When it comes to technologies, we are very optimistic. We have seen uh, big decreases in costs. We expect them to continue along those learning curves. And many of the new renewables are competitive already in, in many circumstances. Uh, uh, we see for hydropower also the, the possibility for recognition of the flexibility and water management it can provide, which is important in the climate uh, change environment. Uh, so we think that should be very comforting for politicians, that technology is there and technology will be continuously improved. So that is not really a challenge. It, it, it's more the, uh, the will, the long-term stability and the political frameworks which we need to, to facilitate those investments. So yes, we think the COP is good and the proof is in, in the politics really and the enabling frameworks for keeping the market giving investment signals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. And now our final um, contributor on the panel is um, someone we're working very closely with uh, because part of the Bentham team in, uh, in Paris, uh, Alina Avachenkova, has had a long career on climate issues, um, starting with a doctorate in economics in, in the UK. Um, but she's worked in uh, many areas of relevance in, in I won't go through, through them all, but in consultancy and on the asset side, uh, in the Environmental Defense Fund, um, and particularly in the UNFCCC itself. So I think she has a deeper knowledge than any of us of how the UNFCCC itself works, but across a very broad range. So, Elena, thank you very much for all the work in, in Paris. and. Um, <coughs> Thank you, Nick, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts today. I will not go into discussing negotiation process because I think previous contributions have already done so, but what I will do is uh, give a forward look of what's next and what are the challenges, and I think that uh, builds um, very nicely on what Anya has just said. So basically, if we look at what Paris was about and what is next, is about, in simple terms, on one hand, ambition, and on the other hand, finding means to implement it. And uh, to do so, actually, a very important issue is credibility or trust, as Anya put it. So I think uh, the Paris Agreement clearly shows that the overall ambition level globally is there, yet INDCs, which were put on the table, table don't end up to where we need to be for the two degree scenarios and even less so for 1.5 degree scenarios. I think according to the Paris outcome, the figures were cited that INDCs add up to about 55 gigaton by 2030, where we need to be by to be consistent with 1.5, it's probably around 40, so there is still a gap that needs to be filled. So why credibility is important? So basically, in order to ramp up ambition in the future, and actually actually even to implement what's already there, countries need to trust each other, uh, need to believe that what is put on the table will actually be held up to and uh, these commitments 
will be honored. Secondly, it's important for delivering on this means that I mentioned to actually implement, uh, because investors will not go, as, as the previous speakers have uh, alluded to, they will not invest into programs, policies that they don't believe will be credible and will be honored. And so to look into this issue, we have done a study with my colleague Samuel Abbasi, who is somewhere at the end of this room, uh, for Paris, where we have developed a framework to assess credibility of pledges that countries put forward in order to actually help countries understand the areas that they can strengthen um, at the next step. So we've analyzed the literature which, uh, in, in economics, but also in financial uh, literature in terms of policy credibility, and basically came up with a simplified framework which has four main elements, rules and procedures, um, decision-making processes, um, norms and public opinion, and past performance. And within that, we basically developed um, um, eight, uh, identified eight determinants. So in the ideal case, um, a country's pledge would be credible if it is supported by a coherent and comprehensive uh, legislative and policy basis, and carbon pricing would be um, one element of that, but there are more. Um, also by transparent, inclusive, and effective decision-making process uh, that uh, has features built in that doesn't allow for easy or permanent abolish, abolition of policy, but also creates enough opportunity to build consensus and bring stakeholders in. Thirdly, it needs to be supported by dedicated public bodies and in an ideal case, again, supportive private bodies such as strong NGO lobby for climate policy and ideally not very effective high carbon lobby. Um, um, then uh, it, there is also needs to be, his, well, in the ideal case country which has a history of international engagement which puts high value on commitments that it makes internationally its pledge should be also more credible and uh, climate aware public opinion in the country both in terms of awareness of climate change impacts but also importance of action on climate change also is supportive and finally um, past performance is very important because consistency breeds credibility governments which have shown consistency in sticking to their promise, they are treated as more credible um, investment partners um, and um, they also negotiation partners. So those countries which have history of past policy abolition, which is Australia, could be one example, would have slightly more challenge in um, proving to the world and to the investors as well, to the private sector, that they're going to stick to their commitments. So having developed this framework, what we've done, we've applied it to the G20 countries, again, just to, to give an example of how it could work and how it could help policymakers identify areas to focus on. And what we have found that on average for G20 countries, uh, actually no country starting from scratch. There is some basis for implementing um, uh, these INDCs. And in some countries it is stronger, in others it is weaker. But in general, um, the strongest area um, across uh, G20 is legislation and policy, where a lot of advances have happened in a few years. Yet, so there are still differences if we look between developed and developing countries. So in developing countries, among emerging economies in the G20, we noted that um, in general, decision-making processes tend to be weaker than in the industrialized countries, and um, also uh, public opinion in certain cases is not yet there, the awareness on, on, on the importance of climate change. So these are the areas to strengthen. Uh, if I give some, some examples of, of particular countries, so uh, we have identified a group of, so to say, um, uh, countries where credibility is supported, um, at, at, at least uh, all of the determinants of credibility are at least largely supportive um, or fully supportive of, of their pledge, and those countries um, are mainly European Union and its member states that are part of G20, as well as Korea. Um, they, they have, um, for, for, for all of them, they have quite a balanced um, 
performance on, on most determinants of credibility, yet there are areas that can still be improved. Uh, for example, for career reporting on greenhouse gas emissions could be uh, the frequency of, of that reporting and the data could be improved. In certain countries, public opinion uh, could still as well be, um, be strengthened. Then we identified a group of countries which includes actually most of the emerging, uh, well, a lot of the emerging economies as well well as um, Australia, Russia, Japan, um, and United States, which uh, perform kind of moderately on, on, on most of the determinants of credibility, but have one or two areas where they can still improve. And the United States, obviously, adopting a framework overall legislation, climate change would go a long way, um, although we know that the political conditions perhaps are not there for that as yet. And then there are several countries which still have quite a large scope uh, for improvement, including Saudi Arabia, Canada, Argentina, and a few others. So to summarize, basically, um, I can't obviously present all of the detailed results here, but the paper is on, online if, if you're interested. But what we're hoping with this is to provide a tool for countries to once compare themselves against each other, but also to see where they can put the effort. And um, the main areas where um, the results are showing um, the focus should be. Firstly, is on legislation and policy in a number of countries <coughs> adopting framework legislation following uh, Paris will be quite important. And in those countries like UK, which already have legislation as uh, Climate Change Act, the question will be, is it still ambitious enough given the Paris outcome and 1.5 degree reference, or should there be ramping up of ambition uh, going forward? Um, Secondly, on the decision-making processes, uh, it is important to consider safeguards for ensuring commitment that was made uh, in Paris, and uh, research suggests that creating more veto points in the political system helps you keep that, as well as engaging stakeholders and building political consensus. And finally, uh, we also noted through this analysis that more work can be done to strengthen uh, public bodies in particular, and in many countries, uh, this would imply also creating independent advisory body like the Climate Change Committee in, in, uh, here in, in the UK, which helps keep government in, government in check and helps provide for continuity of policy. So I think these are some of the areas and, and of course um, if, uh, if countries uh, now focus on um, putting some of these um, elements in place, uh, the important next question will be how to attract finance and improving credibility along these determinants will help in doing so. But one additional area that, um, that hasn't been mentioned yet, it is about helping developing countries actually identify concrete uh, policies and options for reducing emissions and preparing them into financeable, turning them into financeable propositions, which, uh, which is an area where sometimes there is still a lack of capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. Um, I think we've had very uh, thoughtful, interesting contributions from very different perspectives, although um, very strong and uh, encouraging ones as well. Um, let, let me try to identify a few areas to um, kick off a, a quick discussion on the panel and then we'll open up for the audience. But I want to spend quite a lot of time on the audience part as well, so let's just take a few minutes for the panel. Um, one issue that ran through um, much of what we've been talking about, and it's obviously central, is the credibility and direction of policy post-Paris. EU, UK, China's 13th five-year plan, what's coming in India uh, across the world. Um, and that's right across the board. I and mean, we focus particularly on carbon pricing and so on, but surely that would be true of forests and, uh, and everything. So perhaps we could um, focus our attention at the beginning on the credibility of policy and associate that as well with something that's very close to it, of course, which is the management of risk, since the lack of credibility in policy is one of the biggest generators of risk. And indeed, the biggest deterrent to investment around the world is government-induced policy risk. And certainty isn't on offer, but reduced uncertainty should be. 
and uh, so as well as thinking about the credibility of po policy, we should also be thinking about the management of risk and understanding risk in the system. So if we could begin with just a few minutes on the panel on that, and then I'll, I'll open it up to the audience and there'll be other aspects which we haven't covered in cities and innovation and so many other things, but let's do that in uh, interaction. Um, let, let's start with the, the EU uh, ETS. Uh, it's clear, I think, as after Paris, but it was also clear before Paris, that uh, we need a much higher carbon price mm. in Europe. Um, do any of the panel have some views on the prospects for that? The obvious way to do it, you don't need a a degree from London School of Economics to work this out is to have less uh, permits, right? <laughs> uh, more growth and less permits. And uh, more growth takes longer, less permits you can do quite quickly. Um, what are the prospects for that? Should we be <coughs> pushing for carbon price floors as we apparently have in the UK? and? Uh, the, would the panel like to contribute on uh, on that one? And of course, through to California and uh, China and other places where the carbon markets have some importance. Anybody like to comment? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess the, I guess the first question for the for the EU the the EU is now going to have to go off and um, put in place the legislation to deliver the forty percent. Um, the question is... That's 40% 1990 to 2030, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, of course, the, the commitment that European leaders made was to at least 40% domestic. So the question will be, you know, I guess, do, do, are we prepared to go further either now or perhaps in the context of the, of the updating of commitments uh, post-2018 stock take? I think that will be, I mean, the UK's position remains uh, that we are willing to go further in the context of, um, uh, of an ambitious agreement. So clearly, you know, that is, that is going to be an important conversation, so that's the first point. The second point is, you know, I don't think it's a secret. There, there are elements within the EU who will be, not, who will be unlikely to be supportive of that. <laughs> uh, and so that, you know, that will be a conversation that will have to happen. I think the, the proposition is that um, the European Council is going to take stock in October, in, in March, of, of the Paris outcome. But the third thing, so if, if you are going to, if you were going to raise EU ambition, and you know, I'm, obviously I'm not a minister, so we've not had a chance to really assess all this with uh, politically, then by and large, you, you know, what, it's probably less challenging to do it in the effort share side than, than in the. ETS, because if you don't need ETS, you've got to you, you, you raise ambition for everybody. So everybody everybody will be affected. You affect other bits of the system, like the various um, uh, funds that are generated for to help out uh, certain bits of the EU. So the effort share, I mean, it, it's politically contested, like, but, it, but it, it might it might it might be technically less less complex and, and easier to. You know, focus any increased effort on particular bits of the EU rather than on everybody. <laughs> but in the context of an ambitious outcome, has been delivered, right? Correct. So you know, clearly that I mean, you know, it's it's still only a few days ago. So we are going to have to assess this within the UK and then with some EU partners and think about what this means. I, I would have thought it's more likely that any raising of ambition will be in the context of this of the 18, 2018 stock take and then the resubmission, but you know that would be my immediate sense, but I may, you know, do what from other views. And the UK 80% reduction 1990 to 2050 was in the context of two degrees, and in fact uh, Brian Hoskins, a climate scientist and member of the Climate Change Committee, reckons that that was actually 2.1 degrees. I mean, if it was, it, it, precision is not on offer, but it, it was a slightly higher version of two degrees <clears throat> and we've come back with a substantially lower version of two degrees so there could be some revisiting of the UK well the, the, to, to be to be clear the, the goal is to hold the global average temperature increase to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts <coughs> towards 1.5 degrees so it's not it's not the same level of collective commitment as as the two degrees uh, but clearly it's not 
you know, there's clearly, a, there's clearly a, an expectation to pursue efforts, so that clearly means something. And so the um, the Climate Change Committee is, I understand, going to look at uh, uh, what this means uh, and what this could mean for um, for for um, UK carbon budgets. But at the moment, their their, their statutory obligation is is to set up, is to set out targets towards the 2050 goal. That's yep. you know, Please, Anna. Yeah, I, I already mentioned the ETS. Uh, I think, and clearly, we need higher carbon prices. I mean, we as a company see uh, the most modern gas fired power stations, which we have a, a couple of, uh, being mouthboard and co running, which is absurd in this context. Uh, and that is of many reasons, but one of the reasons is a carbon price, which is too low to make that change happen. So we would uh, clearly support a stronger ETS. Uh, I think the best case for us would be to have uh, a change in the cap and have uh, then a un unilateral price across the EU and support the basic idea of the ETS to cut, cut emissions where it's uh, the, the, the most cost efficient. So getting to other instruments would be then a second best solution. Uh, we. And, and there are just some thoughts around it. I mean, are price floors possible without getting price caps at some time? So often they go across, then you get very close to a price ban, then it's more a price instrument than a volume-based instrument. Comes close to a tax. A tax would be more national legislation and not EU-wide. So we, there, there's some concerns what that could, could lead to. But um, a, a stronger ETS as the main instrument to drive investments we strongly support and would, would think is necessary and also the most efficient way of doing it. Yeah, just Thank touching, you, on, touching on that. Um, so we wrote about carbon pricing back in September. And at that time, I think it was around a 30 euro a ton carbon price that made gas competitive with coal on the on the EU ETS. Um, but I wanted to pick up on the point about credibility and credibility of who's going to do what. I'm picking up on, on, on sort of the Australia-China debate. I know it's a bit further away from Europe, but in the sense that I think there's a quite high conviction that China will deliver on its climate goals in relation to how they are articulated in the 13th five-year plan, which will be announced in, in, in next year, and also how they've been embedded in the 12th five-year plan, and also in relation to pollution issues. Now, that impacts other regions that are exporting high-carbon products to uh, China. So even if you're a, a nation that perhaps rejects climate policy, you will still be impacted by what else is going on in the world and, and the degree to which other countries implement their, 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 their climate goals. So I think we'll see investors spending more time thinking about what the, what the sort of trade links are between high carbon and low carbon countries and who is, who, who is vulnerable from, a, from an export perspective. I mean, one of the, I think, sort of important points of the INDCs is, you know, it's 95% of greenhouse gases covered by an INDC. All the Middle Eastern nations coming to the, to the party sort of in, in November just before the talks. Now, a lot of them have been criticised in the past because they're oil producing nations, which are clearly um, exporting products that are, that are high carbon and that are embedded into our transport infrastructure. But the fact that they are engaging with the world and the fact that, um, that, that their, their economic structure will have to change to tackle this, this, the climate issue, you know, that, that's a step, step change in, in the world five years ago, right? So I, th I think thinking about those linkages between trade, how countries are generating their own um, national income, um, and thinking that through will, will be a feature going forward. <coughs> well, I think most, most points have already been covered, but building up on what Zoe said, I, I fully agree that um, I think ca ca countries will be looking more into carbon pricing and um, many INDCs, I think the uh, over 70% of them, if not more, actually have um, emission uh, economy-wide emission, uh, emission targets. And so the next step for these countries would be what are the instruments uh, in, in some cases they're doing it for the first time 
time in the case of developing countries. And so I know that many of them have been using ETS, um, EUETS as an example of how to do things, but also how not to do things in terms of uh, the price signal. And in particular, China has been studying very closely the experience of EUETS. So I think the lessons um, that, that were, well, the points which were raised by previous panelists, they have been taken into account. And I know that um, China in particular has learned a lot from the EU experience. Um, so uh, I think there will be a place for such instruments going forward, um, but uh, the price would need to be in, in line with um, providing enough of a signal to the market to actually reduce emissions. Thank you. Um, uh, let's open it up for discussion. I hope during the course of the discussion we can cover issues like um, innovation, cities, forests, and, and so on. I hope those will arise through the questions, but can we move now to questions from, from the audience? Gentleman in the front row. Jeff from the Commission. Hold on a sec, uh, the mic's just coming. Uh, it helps with the streaming, yeah. Jeff Beacon from the Pollution Tax Association. And if you want forests and cities, uh, forests are burning down now, and they're not in, they weren't in the CMIT-5 models, so the remaining carbon budget we've got is considerably less than 115 tonnes per person in the world. How much would the panel like to knock off that 115 tonnes to cope with burning forests and the projected um, release of carbon from the, um, from, from the Arctic tundra and places up there? And as far as cities go, at the moment it costs about 100 tonnes in, a, in, a, in a, almost a personal remaining carbon budget to fit someone in a city. So how are cities going to expand on our cu current model of importing steel from China and building all these big buildings? And of course that isn't on our carbon budget, is it? Because our, our um, consumption budget's going up while our production budget's going down because we're closing the steel works. Thank you. I'm going to take two more questions and then turn to the panel. The, the lady just here. Hi, um, Joe House, um, Bristol University, IPCC author and Government Office of Science. Um, just to come back a second on your point about forests and CMIT-5, um, land, land use was included in the CMIT-5 models and, and forests were in there. Um, and, and the last IPCC round was the first time that most of the uh, system models did explicitly model land use change. And within the INDCs, about 25% of emissions reduction, 20 to 25% of emissions reductions in the INDCs come from the land sector. However, um, forests were explicit, the questions that was forests were explicitly mentioned in the agreement. Uh, land wasn't mentioned in the agreement due to sensitivities around uh, enabling countries' food security and not wanting to limit agricultural production because of food security. So I wonder what the panel thinks may go forward in terms of signals for greenhouse gas reductions in the land sector that still protect food security. Thank you. Uh, lady in the front, and then we'll take these three, and then we'll go on and hope to take quite a few more. Thank you. Uh, Fiola here for LSC. Um, I wanted to uh, ask a little bit more about the need for a strong ETS. Um, one of the reasons why the ETS has been seen to be underperforming is a strong reliance on grandfathering rather than auctioning, and that uh, has been linked to a strong concern about carbon leakage. And I was wondering whether you could um, uh, give some input on uh, how realistic you think that these concerns for carbon leakage are, and particularly in the context of a new agreement, should we now be less concerned about carbon leakage, and could this affect um, a shift towards more auctioning in the ETS? Thank you. Um, three questions um, covering um, forests, expansion of cities, the role of land and uh, agriculture and ETS, grandfathering and leakage. Uh, who would like to intervene on those, or any one of those? Uh, I, I will do one or two after you have done. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to say a few words about, about forests and ETS um, set of all rolling. So on, on forests, on a general point, I mean, we, we are now shifting 
to think a lot more about implementation. Uh, if you look at the INDCs, they are very few of them are investable documents. We're going to need a huge amount of work to help countries to turn these into documents that can and, and, and to genuine plans. Um, in forests, uh, we, we with Germany and Norway actually made an announcement which didn't get that much attention in, in uh, Paris that we would aim to spend a billion dollars a year supporting uh, developing countries to uh, uh, reduce deforestation uh, and increase forest cover. Um, so, you know, we're going to be thinking about how to do that most effectively. Uh, ideas greatly received. There isn't a huge evidence base in this whole area about what works in relation to spending um, uh, climate finance in general. But if, in, if anything in forests, it's been hardest to disperse money. If you look at mitigation projects, adaptation projects, forestry projects, forests has gone the most slowly. And there's all kinds of reasons for that in terms of, you know, the governance in countries and so on. Um, we also saw some really uh, impressive uh, announcements by big companies about um, moving towards uh, um, taking deforestation out of their supply chains. So I think we need to think about how we build on that. And we know that the Commission, Dutch Presidency, <coughs> is, it, uh, sorry, the, the EU un uh, under the Dutch Presidency is going to think about developing procurement rules to move to um, uh, zero deforestation production. So I think there's a there's a lot of scope to be to, to have a kind of step change in, in activity in, in this area, and uh, it's certainly an area where you know we we would welcome you know thinking and, and guidance on 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 how we can play our part in relation to the ETS. You know I, I think I think it's generally clear that it that uh, the costs of uh, of, carb of of of, ET of car regulation for, for for climate are pretty low proportion of costs for all except a few particular sectors which generally do face face competition uh, from from elsewhere and I think those sectors are going to continue to need protection you know steel and and so on um, but I think what we need to do is really focus that protection on the sectors that need it. The, the list of sectors in the current regulation is really, you know, I mean, it's orange grow growers, for example, I think, get protection. So, you know, we really need to focus it on those energy intensive sectors which, which need protection, which is what we're we'll going to do in the upcoming negotiations. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I could perhaps uh, briefly say something about agriculture. I think um, uh, you, you're very right in pointing out that it was quite a political issue because a lot of countries well directly linked to food security discussions. So that's why it's not so prominent in the agreement directly. Having said that, there is a lot of work happening uh, at the practical level in terms of countries working together to find solutions to low, lower emissions from agriculture. And I know, for example, Australia and New Zealand Zealand, um, Argentina, and the other countries have been working for several years together to uh, develop um, co cooperative frameworks on how both, um, well, um, in terms of exchanging experiences on technologies where by switching crops or increasing productivity, uh, you can at the same time uh, limit the amount of emission reductions, but yet keep the yield to the, to the same level and also have been playing around with climate finance um, initiative that, that could help developing countries finance uh, finance this transition. But it's obviously still a, is a big challenge and quite a lot of countries are in, in, indicated in their indices that this is where they want to focus as they look for options to, uh, to transition to low carbon economy. So I think that's uh, a priority issue to consider. Uh, let, let me add uh one or two things. Um, first on uh, carbon leakage. It's amazing how many industries who are in difficulty for various reasons uh, blame it on um, climate policy. And mostly it's rubbish. Um, if the price of steel falls by 40 or 50 percent, the price of steel has fallen by 40 or 50 percent. And that is the most important influence on your profitability. The carbon pricing component in that story of reduced profits is generally pretty small. The reason that manufacturing, low-cost manufacturing grew outside the rich countries was because um, labor was cheaper in those places and skills and infrastructure had 
improved. That's called <coughs> the process of development. Nothing to do with carbon leakage, leakage a process that was uh, part of economic history, well underway, uh, well before the, the UNFCCC was created, let alone climate policies put in place. So the carbon leakage story is generally colossally overdone, particularly when we bear in mind that we're thinking of a world that is looking out in a better direction, and when you pick up and go, you have to think of where the place you might pick up and go to is going to be 10, 15, 20 years from now. So I don't want to dismiss it as an issue, but look, look very carefully at carbon leakage arguments. They are mostly colossally overdone. Um, secondly, the move into cities um, is going to happen. Uh, whether we approve or disapprove, there's about 50% in cities slightly over now, towns and cities, and that will probably go up to 70% by the middle of the century. Uh, there's no set of armies that are going to put up walls around cities and uh, keep people out. What we, neither would we want it in my view, in uh, this is something we can plan for, uh, because it's going to happen and if we build our cities well and we do it well they can be cleaner more attractive places where you can move around in unpolluting ways where you can breathe or we can do it badly and it seems to me the big choice is not whether people move into cities or not because they will the main choice is what kind of cities we build and create and that's where we should uh, be focusing um, focusing our attention finally on land um, it, it is obviously political because it's about uh, big fractions of the population who depend on agriculture and of course agriculture produces food and people eat food. The, um, but there's so much that you can do. Uh, Alina already uh, began. I, I've lived much of my life in agriculture in developing countries starting with tea in Kenya in the 60s and wheat in India in the 70s and that's sort of what I do. Um, it's not the only thing. <laughs> but the, um, there are enormous number of alternatives. I mean, system of root intensification for rice is uh, uh, a system where, you know, you transplant more carefully, but you flood the fields much less. And that re reduces methane um, emissions from the fields. It generally gives you an agriculture which is more robust. To, uh, so it's adaptation, it's more climate resilient, and it saves on water and energy, which is good development. There's so many things like that where, um, without necessarily making it a big totem in uh, INDCs, we can pursue as a world much more promising policies which bring uh, development, uh, mitigation, adaptation, food security together. And that's that's where we should be looking at good development. And if it starts to filter into the INDCs, then good. But we should be doing it uh, anyway. I think we have to bear in mind that not all um, animal husbandry is similar. Uh, sheep, cattle, which graze on um, grass, have a different effect from those which are fed on soya, where that soya arises from cutting down forests. We have to look quite carefully at the means of uh, production as a world, and uh, there really are alternatives there. It's not some fixed thing that we have to, to carry. There are great opportunities for making agriculture much more productive, much less emission, much less emitting, and much more climate resilient. I hope, for example, that's something that DFID would concentrate on. Indeed, they, I know they do take that uh, issue seriously. So next round of questions. There were some people at that side. The gentleman just here, please. Hi, uh, Carmen Mack from Imperial. Uh, two quick questions, if you may. Um, how do you see the phrasing of the term net zero by 
end of by second half of the century uh, being interpreted by different people. For example, Amber Rudd yesterday um, said it was by the end of the second by the end of the century as opposed to by the second half. Um, and second question is uh, regarding policy risk. Let's say Republicans win the U.S. presidency next year. How do you see that impacting on future on on this whole agenda? Uh, at least through the 2020 or potentially 2024. Thanks. A gentleman with a beard there. Thank you, Phil Coventry, Reading University. Um, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but you you can read quite widely about um, fossil fuel subsidies, um, and there are lots of statistics around about the the kind of the how much more subsidies go to fossil fuels every year than um, renewables. Um, in the context of the sort of policy consistency and the price signals that the panel have been talking about, um, I'm just interested in in whether Paris um, might be a signal for changing those kind of the, the structure of those sorts of subsidies and, um, and and the impact that might have on on the renewable sector. Thank you. Thank you. L lady just here on this side. Okay. I'll do my best to get round everybody. <laughs> Please keep the questions sh short and we'll do our best to keep the answers short. Uh, thank you. Hello. Hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I've got three quick questions. Could you uh, make that too? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Uh, is, um, well, at least propose to study charging climate change. think those policies are going to help um, rectify the distorted retail uh, market price or is only only going to make things worse and at least in the short term make things less affordable um, um, because I'm actually working for a local authority in East London, so I'm more interested in domestic questions. So the question to Peter is that since the summer budget, um, the UK government has made some uh, significant re um, regressions um, um, and uh, cutbacks on um, kind of um, uh, finance and also support for, um, for example, renewables and also domestic energy efficiency. And it's not really picturing uh, a bright the society of feel like it's quite doomed and lots of us are losing our statutory functions because of that. So um, how long and um, what do you think would happen to pull us out of that misery? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, meaning of net zero, um, Republican president, maybe implications in the United States, fossil fuel subsidies, support for renewables and uh, domestic energy um, <coughs> efficiency. Um, the uh, Republican President of the United States is um, not something that we can do uh, very much about. Um, and so it doesn't seem to me to be a lot we can contribute, although we can reflect on it, um, but it is a contributor to un uncertainty, um, but I don't see what else we can say, yeah? Um, <clears throat> not telling you who to vote for, but I don't know how many people have a vote uh, in that country. Um, on uh, net uh, zero, um, Pete, could I ask you to say something of that on that and then touch on the question about domestic um, uh, energy efficiency, various aspects of support in, in UK policy, and then we'll go to the others, the other things. Is that is that all right? Sure, Nick. Uh, so, so on the question of net net zero, I mean the the article says what it says, which is in the second half of the century. So, you know, I, I'm not going to provide a very commentary on what the Secretary of State said in the Select Committee. Um, she's not she's not necessarily re re quoting verbatim from what's in the agreement. Just a word about um, what happens in um, in the U.S. 
you know, clearly, it, as you say, Nick, we don't have any uh, influence over what happens in the United States, and that's a matter for them. Um, but a lot of what's the, the action that's being taken is is now increasingly embedded. It's embedded in what companies are doing. It's embedded in what individual states are doing. So I don't think we, we we should assume that everything will be will be wound back. I think a lot of this stuff, even in Republican states, actually, you know, renewable portfolio stands, for example, actually, you know, is 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 increasingly popular and is is cost effective. Um, I think it matters. It will also make a difference whether we have both. But if, if, if both Repub if, if the presidency were Republican and both houses of Congress were Republican, that, would, that might be a different scenario than if, for example, the Senate remained uh, or, or became a, a Democrat. Um, I'm not going to comment on domestic policy, Nick. Okay. Uh, Pete's a civil servant, not a politician, so that's uh, his... Uh it, it, it's the it's the right answer, Pete. Um, but uh, I don't know, yeah, yeah, you're, you're you're not a civil servant. <laughs> yes, yeah. on, on the U.S., obviously, a lot of well, basically, the target that the U.S. has put on the table can be achieved through Obama's clean clean power plan, which is an executive um, legislation based on the Clean Air Act, and uh, the authority to legislate was given by a Supreme Court decision that uh, greenhouse gases should be treated as pollutants. So should we get a president in the United States who does not support um, uh, action on climate change, they would still have to go through a number of steps. There are certain hurdles built into the system, so they can't just um, just cancel the Clean Power Plan. And having the Supreme Court decision already there, it will be difficult uh, because the uh, Supreme Court, again, is, is more likely to rule again in favor of EPA having to, to regulate. Um, and just um, an anecdote from from Paris, uh, I have attended an event which was run by the power utilities from the US uh, and EPA administrator was there as well. And the discussion was basically also what happens, um, in particular some Republican states are currently opposing the Clean Power Plan and there are challenges in the court. What was said is that while the states are challenging and in the meanwhile utilities are actually and, and um, private sector players are basically moving quietly to implement it. So the market is moving. So I think um, it's going to be quite difficult to just undo what has been done already. Thank you. And, and remember, uh, I'll, I'll go to both Anna and Zoe, but remember Jerry Brown was uh, re-elected as governor of California with almost 60% uh, of the vote uh, on uh, a platform which included quite strong environmental and uh, climate, climate action. So the U.S. really is a, a complicated differentiated uh, place. Uh, Anna and then Zoe. Thank you. Um, just a few words about subsidies. Uh, of course, what we from, from, from the sector always ask for is long-term stable policy frameworks. And subsidies is one of the policy instruments. And lots of changes, are, if, if, if they're not foreseen, are, of course, not very welcomed. When that is said, subsidies are meant to help something uh, to get to profitability, to competitiveness. When costs change, of course, subsidies could be, can be reduced as well, and they will be changed in, in general. But still, it can be perceived as something which is taken away from you, because it, it seems to be something which is certain. And, and that can create a lot of unrest. Uh, so, in general, subsidies are probably necessary for some technologies, especially the less mature technologies, which cannot get to the market with only a carbon price or the current carbon price. But when that is said, I think, uh, as it is a very specific policy instrument, we probably need to accept changes in subsidies when the costs change and those technologies get more or less mature yeah. and compared to the market price, just as a general comment to that. Thank you. Sorry. And <clears throat> ask you for me. So on the subsidies point, I, I think that it's worth reiterating that Paris is just one step and that discussions around all of these issues have been ongoing for a long time. Paris has mobilized awareness in a broader context and has been covered incredibly well by media, financial institutions, businesses, etc. And that has been brilliant um, for, for the awareness and climate as a whole. Um, but many countries are taking steps to remove fossil fuel subsidies, um, implement some form of carbon pricing mechanism. And I think that the th thread that is coming through all of these questions uh, of, of, of 
what to celebrate in relation to them is the role of non-state actors. So the California provincial drivers, what investors and corporates are doing. Um, so I, I was just going to say it's worth remembering Paris as a signal for change rather than the be-all and end-all milestone to delivery. There's a lot of this stuff going on already. But it would be very nice if it helped accelerate <laughs> the removal of fossil fuel subsidies. Mm. Um, that's been a, a, a recurring theme in the G20 and uh, China's presidency of the G20 next year I think will be very important. Um, in the nature of things, you, you don't get to be president of the G20 uh, any sooner than another two decades and actually it's more than 20. So um, that I think is going to be a very important part of international discussion of uh, economic policy. And uh, as Zoe indicated, China's 13th five year plan, which is more or less done, will be released in the early part of, of next year. So I think that is a very important area of, um, of discussion. Um, could we um, move to the next round of questions, please? Uh, lady just here. Hi, um, Olivia Alessi. Um, so I just have a quick question for you on um, fixed income and um, mixed funds like swaps, derivatives, etc. Um, neglected child um, of ESG. Sorry, can you speak up a little yeah, bit? Yeah, sorry. Um, how do you, um, are, do you see investors developing a strategy to manage carbon um, for those assets where really it's very difficult to develop an ESG strategy? The gentleman in the front row here. <laughs> Sam Fang Kaiser, in case you don't recognize me. Um, quick question about ratification. How long will it take? Uh, lady just here. I'm doing my best on gender equality. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it's a requirement at the LSE, and it, it should be a requirement more generally. Well, thank you very much as an alumni of LSE. Um, uh, my question is specifically about the uh, design of the phase four of the EU ETS. Um, I w sorry, I w my name's Margaret Ann Splon. I work for Redshaw Advisors. We're a carbon risk management firm. And we deal specifically in compliance, well, not just specifically, but in compliance carbon. So I speak to the end users. Um, and my question is that phase four has been uh, approved. It'll be 2021 to 2030. Um, we were recently invited by the European Commission to participate participate in one of their workshops uh, about the design of phase four. But now given that COP21 has happened, and this has been a great positive signaling, what my question to you is how do you think that COP21 will affect the design of phase four? Because it's difficult to uh, put in new legislation that's already ongoing. And phase three, which we're currently in, it was very difficult to get the backloading through, very difficult to get the market stability reserve. And so right now, We've got, for example, the carbon leakage, the lady that asked that. There's 120 um, sectors on the current carbon leakage list. We already know that phase four, there will only be 50 sectors. But since it's not already established, I'm very curious as to how you guys think the, uh, the design of, uh, uh, that how COP21 will affect the design of phase four of the EU HS. Thank you. Well, the, the two questions, I think, around fixing common investors and the compliance question, which I think are for Zoe and Anna, and then uh, I'll ask um, uh, Pete and Alina if they have anything to say on uh, ratification. So, Anna or Zo Zoe, which... I'll go. Yeah. Okay. So, the question on um, so think, fixed income and environmental, social and governance and, and how um, and what we think about that. So. Um, I have to say I disagree with you when you mentioned that you think that um, ESG is it's quite difficult to devise an ESG strategy. Oh, <laughs> okay. So I, I don't think it is difficult to devise an ESG strategy. Um, what's difficult about having an Could ESG? Could you spell out the uh, ESG? Yes. So environment. So some investors, well, many, most investors these days have adopted um, a way of incorporating environmental, social, and governance factors in the way they assess their investment portfolio. So there's an, an initiative set up by the UN Principles for Responsible Investment, which was launched around 10 years ago now, where 
investor signatories um, signed up to a pledge that said they would incorporate environmental, social and governance um, issues into their, their decision making. And I think it's, I've lost track of the amount of assets under management, somebody in the room might know, know more than I do, um, that, uh, that, are, that have uh, signed up to that initiative, but it's in the trillions. Um, and so the, the first means of, of doing that was to engage with um, companies on, on what they were doing in, in relation to ESG. So as shareholders, investors have a clout of, of, of and a say of how the, the businesses should, should further grow their earnings stream. Um, and, <coughs> and as an extension of that, that's moved more in towards the fixed income markets and climate strategy and, how, and the growth of the green bond market. So in terms of having an overall asset allocation strategy that incorporates sustainability and ESG in investing, I, I think that's a fairly straightforward thing to do because you can incorporate it into equities and fixed income. Um, the, the difficulty around ESG investing and sustainability investing is proving that it adds value. Um, and that proof is where you get disagreement. So, so you get disagreement around the sort of, th th there's, there's limited disagreement that there's long-term benefit, but there's a lot of disagreement over how that translates into short-term performance behavior. So what investors are asking, and, and by investors in this context, I'm talking about people that look at secondary market participation. So they're buying shares and buying bonds um, f uh, and generally managing perhaps pension money um, uh, for, for the population. So in terms of how they're thinking about a climate strategy, Many of them have started to assess the carbon intensity of different companies that they're holding. So, so many of them will invest according to different um, benchmarks across the world, so an equity benchmark, for instance. And within that, they'll have to hold a certain weight of, say, utilities companies or oil and gas companies. In the utilities sector, um, more, well, more specifically, some are thinking about the exact number of coal-fired power facilities that that utility owns and the grade of coal that is used within those facilities and we're having discussions about that and that's how they're differentiating the carbon risk within utilities across the portfolio as a whole they're then having to think about sort of whether for instance miners are mining coal versus other assets and, and how that split works um, but essentially the, the range of sophistication on this really depends from the region that they're positioned in so European investors and French investors in particular are incredibly forward thinking on this versus perhaps Asian investors which, which have, a, have a different outlook um, but nevertheless the agenda is moving forward a lot of people ask me are green bonds good um, yes I think green bonds are good in the sense that they have brought an overwhelming new audience into understanding around climate risk. So in an ideal world, we wouldn't need to label a bond green. We would understand the use of proceeds and we would understand whether that bond, whether that capital raising was for a green, uh, low carbon world or a, or a high carbon one. Um, so in terms of, of, of the agenda of investors, I think it varies in sophistication. Thank you, Anna. Do you want to add something? I don't think I have to add that much. It's not my area of. So we are a renewable company, so we have been in those markets forever. It's just my concern is that the high, um, some investors might see COP, which is unfortunate in my opinion, as hyperbole, and we require, it requires such a level of sophisticated understanding. I'm just worried that the outcome from COP won't get through to those. Well, I, I don't think the COP is very esoteric. I mean, it, it, no. the, the clear, the clear, uh, well below two degrees, the, the clear intention to come back and revise upwards, you know, the mission innovation. It, 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 the next questions are about what happens at uh, country levels, uh, innovation internationally, forests internationally. So I, I don't think it's that mysterious, um, but it's something that uh, public discussion is, uh, is critical for and, and political action. Um, but on ratification... I, I presume your question, Sam, is about UK and EU ratification or everybody's no, ratification? No, the thing coming to force. It took seven years in Kyoto, three years for the UNFCCC. Right. So in order for this to enter into force, it needs 55 parties representing 55% of emissions. <coughs> uh, that's what it says in the agreement. Um, 
I, I, I think you might see some parties ratify reasonably quickly. Uh, I think others may take a bit longer. Usually, uh, countries or parties will want to make sure they've got all their domestic legislation in place to deliver what they're signing up to before they ratify. So, in the case of the EU, we're going to have to enact the 2030 package, the effort share decision and the ETS uh, revision, uh, I would have thought before we ratify the usual EU practice is that we aim to ratify, we all, all the member states and the EU aim to ratify at the same time. So that might take a couple of years, whereas others might come more quickly. Could, maybe I could just add something. I mean, I, I'm just, we are, we've just got over Paris <laughs> and we're still recovering. Uh, you know, we're all just beginning to think about what are the priorities net for now, and I'm, you know, a sense that that debate is kind of emerging in the room. Yeah. So, you know, we are definitely in the market for, you know, thoughts about this. I mean, for us, there's there's some stuff that's more techy and the stuff that's less techy. So, we, firstly, we're going to we've got a huge amount of stuff to do through the through the NFCCC, where there's provision for detailed rules to be adopted on things like the transparency regime. So that's one leg for us. The second is we've got a 50% increase in UK climate finance. Indeed, it will double by the year 2020. But the the, the increase over the SR period is is is, is 50%. Spending review period, yeah. Yeah, so we, we you know we, we want to stand back and think. Well, what are the priorities for that? That's six, six billion pounds. It's a lot of money, but it's not a lot in terms of the scale of the transformation you're trying to generate. So how can we use that money best? And I think now is the right time to stand back and really think about that. And that, as I said before, there isn't much of an evidence base. So I think there's a lot of we have certainly been appetite on our side to for thoughts or guidance on that. The third thing is EU legislation, which is going to start rolling forward. We've already got the ETS proposal. I think we'll see the effort share decision in the second second quarter of the year. I mean, quite interested that people are already raising the question, well, should we be raising ambition at this stage? Should we be looking at modifying the ETS proposal? I'm not responsible for the ETS in the department, by the way, but, you know, obviously have a close interest. So, you know, again, I think, I think now's the time to start generating some intellectual uh, yeah. sort of activity in that space. Uh, third, fourth area is, you know, definitely we, we need a bit of a political strategy going forward, because inevitably climate may drop down a bit. It's been at the top, it's going to come down a bit. But we've got some set pieces this year. We've got the um, European Council in March. I think it's pr pr proposed that there should be a very high level signing ceremony in New York in, in April for the for the agreement. 22nd. Right. Earth Day. Oh, well, high level. Mr. High Level's been invited, I'm sure. We've <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, got the G20. It's my birthday. <laughs> We've got the, chi the Chinese uh, leadership and the G20 on the phone, certainly Mark Carney. You know, there's an awful, so just mapping out the year and also beginning to build towards the stock taking 2018 and, and the updating, I think, is you know, beginning to identify what that looks like will be important. And finally, there's all the other real world stuff, the, the action agenda stuff. You know, for my, what we'll have to do is, in my team is think about w where we can make a difference, and recognizing that we're only one player. But we'll certainly be thinking about whether there are particular issues where we would want to get involved. For example, mission innovation. We're going to need to think about what the priorities are for that. Um, just, just online, the UK was one of 20 countries that signed up in mission innovation to double its R&D on uh, clean energy research. And then others like um, Bill Gates and Richard Branson, Mukesh Shambani, Ray Dalio came in uh, also with a little group put together by Bill Gates. So there's quite substantial public and private money hmm. going into clean energy innovation and how that is uh, allocated, spent and how productive that money is, is terribly important in what, what happens yeah. next. Yeah. So I, I, I mean that was a long-winded way of saying I didn't know the answer to all the questions, but I think, which are, but I think that's fair enough. I think you know we are just after a very you know COP, which is way above our expectations, and we should all, as a com community, climate community, sort of take stock and think about what how we move forward and have a bit of intellectual ferment about it. Yeah. Now uh, I'm going to take three very short questions. Uh, gentleman right at the back there, the glasses. Yeah. Hi, Richard Madani. I'll just uh, speak first as a, an investor, as a chair of a local authority pension fund. There's a lot being done, and actually the challenge really is to keep the momentum from, from what's happened. Um, just this morning, I'm sort of trying to co-file motions for Exxon and keep on the work for BP and Shell, and my pension fund's been really key on in, in involving 
building on what happened. My question to you was, how do we keep the notoriously short attention span of politicians and focus on this? Um, I, I, I appreciate you can't, you're dodging the question from the, the lady in front of me on, on UK domestic policy versus international policy. Your team have done a clearly amazing job internationally. Um, and I'm just reading the Fit and Rock uh, Fit Banding uh, review as they come out. How do we keep politicians and hold their feet to the fire now they've committed something so interna uh, broad internationally? Okay. Thank you. Um, this gentleman just here. Yeah, hi, Ben Coombs, Llewellyn Consulting. My question really is about the peer review process because it strikes me, having read the document yesterday, that at its core is a peer review, a bottom-up peer review process where countries are going to try and put pressure on each other to ratchet up ambition. Now, we've seen from the OECD experience that two things are generally required for that. A very strong secretariat and usually one strong or large country in the lead, in the case of the OECD, it's tended to be the US throughout its history. So what do we see the credibility of the institutional framework underneath COP to deliver um, and ratchet up ambition through peer pressure? And which countries do you see might take the lead going forward? Thank you. And gentlemen, just behind you, last question. Thank you. Um, You've thank you to your panel, and you've discussed about carbon pricing and ETS markets lengthily. Um, I wanted to ask, what are your thoughts on the role of carbon offsetting, um, and does it have any role in this COP um, process? And if so, where would you see it developing? Thank you very much. So the first two questions uh, really about um, implementation in some shape or form. First one on the attention span of um, politicians and um, the second one on more institutional side of implementation and how how does it happen and finally uh, offsets um, well those of you who are deeply involved in carbon pricing can I just do the offset one first that Alina or or, no, or, 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 or Anna, Anna? <laughs> yeah, I can well, go. Question about offsets, right? Yeah, offset. I mean, in the EU, in order to keep carbon prices efficient right now, probably offsets uh, are, would lower them, so that would be uh, not so good. In order to link different carbon markets together, it would offsets are necessary and would be a good thing. So I think in the long term, we need offsets to make uh, carbon tradable across the world and to get to one global carbon price. So ramp up ambition and have offsets at the same time, I think, is one way. Yeah. Um, now, um, keeping politicians' feet to the fire. Well, we began in the Lords on Tuesday afternoon. I mean, I don't want to harp on my own experience, but that was our first shot. And uh, the statement of Amber Rudd, which had previously the Secretary of State for the Department of Energy and Climate Change, which had been read in the Commons, was read in the Lords, that's the convention in these things. The gentleman who read it was Lord Bourne, Nick Bourne, uh, who was at Paris and played an important part in the process. And I think we quite rightly congratulated the UK team uh, on what had been achieved. I think Pete Vett's name was also mentioned, I should say. And um, so the next question was, given that the ambition has been ramped up, what happens next in terms of increasing um, the policies or adjusting policies to fit. So I think that's the kind of discussion that uh, will take place uh, around the world. And uh, it comes from uh, citizens, it comes from political processes, and particularly importantly, I think it comes from business and firms uh, who see the opportunities but need the policy credibility to make it happen. It comes from examples. The cities were very well represented in uh, Paris and they're getting on with it. C40 is now I think C80, 83 or 4 or, or something, the, the, the coalition of, of cities. So I think it's through those kinds of political processes which will involve you know, politics, people, NGOs, business, cities. That's the kind of story in my view which will keep the attention span. Anyone would like to comment on the more institutional side of delivery around secretariats, Alina? 
So basically, under UNFCCC, the measurement reporting and verification system is, uh, well, we, we already have some basics in place uh, for developed countries that was established under the Kyoto Protocol. And basically, the way it works is that you have um, experts which are vetted, uh, selected in a competitive way internationally who are specialists in emission inventories and institutional systems that countries need to build. And basically, um, teams are created from these experts representing different countries, but they act in their expert capacity. They're not politicians. And they go, and, and this process is managed by UNFCCC secretariat, so they go to countries and review what's currently in place. Um, for developing countries, the requirements on measurement, uh, reporting, and verification of emissions was um, was softer because obviously they, they, they don't have the same capacity. So um, I think um, about uh, two, two years ago, there was a decision that um, developing countries would also start reporting in a more comprehensive way on what they're doing for biennial update reports, and there is an international process established, which is called international consultation analysis, where these update reports are brought and discussed and ways to improve um, um, are determined. So for the Paris Agreement now, the next step is, and I think that's what, um, what the agreement says, uh, there will need to be developed a detailed uh, guidelines and procedures for how this review process will happen. But I think there are some elements in place that we can build upon through this biennial update reports, international consultation analysis, but also from the experience of implementing Kyoto Protocol. But maybe Pete has more insight to that. No, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I don't think it's, I wouldn't describe it as peer review as the sort of sole basis. I think there's a, first of all, is that there's this five year stock take where we're looking at aggregate where we are. And that, that, that should put pressure on all of us to think about whether we can do more. I think it's also about, you know, highlighting to countries' own civil society, you know, what, what that country might be doing and, what, whether that, and so that, you know, that country can assess whether it can do more. I think the transparency is also a big part of that and helps that. In terms of the review process, this is a deeply sensitive subject for some of our partners, and so, you know, it's very clear language that this is non-punitive, non-intrusive. So, you know, I think if we were going to think about how to make it really effective, we'd need to and draw lessons from other regimes, which I think is a good thought. We really have to think about how we could do that in a way that respected those sensitivities, uh, you know, and enabled the thing to, to, you know, to work to their satisfaction, um, you know. And so probably the sort of peer review is the wrong notion. It is, it is about kind of helping everybody to ra raise their game progressively, individually, yeah. collectively. Thank you very much. So that, that's how I would describe the peer review process. Okay. I mean, in an international context, that's what it, what it means. I think mean, we talk to the ABCD about peer review and uh, working through and practicing that kind of vision. That's exactly what it happens. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, now, we're, we are now um, out of time. Um, I don't want to try to attempt uh, a big summary of two hours of discussion. Um, but I think we have seen that our own discussion, and let's hope we're representative of the world, um, or rep I'd better be careful, but, um, the, is about what happens next, that this was uh, a remarkable outcome. Uh, it was up the high end of the expectations of most of us who were involved and had looked and participated, it looked at and participated in these processes over a very long period of time. That seems to me to be a good problem to have. Uh, had it been very disappointing, we'd have had another sort of problem. Um, but this one is how do we implement as a world something good? Um, we've seen that uh, this is not a world of formal sanctions and one of the lessons that we learnt I think over the years is to trying to turn something into a heavy formal sanction story makes agreement much less likely and ambitions much less strong and I think that was a very important part of the, getting the success and it will be a very important part of making it happen so we have to turn this collaboration into mutual self-help, a bit of competition, uh, setting the stage for the investment through public policies in different places around the world, cities collaborating as they are. These will be the elements of different kinds that come. Some of it will be collaboration, some of it will be sharing of technology, some part of it will be the green race, and a bit of green racing is uh, very good. 
the appropriate powered uh, vehicles, of course. Um, so that story of implementation, I think, should follow the same kind of spirit that we're seeing. The politics will be important, the industry will be important. But that, I think, is where we focused rightly. Within that overall story, I don't want to sort of pick out different bits too heavily. Carbon pricing, of course, was strong in our discussion, as it should be. Fossil fuel subsidies, uh, very strong recognition that this isn't only a pricing and subsidy story, it's innovation regulation uh, as well, including regulations and understandings around disclosure and uh, assessing risks. So we had a wide-ranging uh, discussion there, um, but it was a cheerful discussion about how to make things happen, uh, realizing that uh, a convention and its outcome is one thing and what happens next is another thing, but it's very nice to have that uh, challenge and uh, problem. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for those who organized with prescience the importance of having uh, such an event. Thanks to Pete and everybody else who made it uh, the agreement into reality and recognizing that this was something that came from many people as it should given the collaborative global process that lies underneath it all. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.